my name is Daniel Moller. In some time, I'm going to have some uh, slides on the screen. I'm coming from Berlin now, the un unexpected uh, startup capital of Europe now. At least there's something good in Brexit, you can say. And uh, I'm trying to condense uh, eight years of experience with data to like 30 minutes. I don't consider myself an expert at all. I just have experience maybe. And most likely what I'm trying to tell you is more relevant to startups because I'm doing startups for 18 years now. And uh, I'm trying to, to tell you about the day-to-day -day suffering of people who do data. So there's like no fluff, no cloud, no whatnot. Good, so I'm going to be even faster than I was expected to be. So uh, please feel free to ask questions and for quite quick clarification after the thing. So uh, in the previous years, I used to be called all kind of stuff. But, and I did like productivity, urban mobility, I worked with AWS, worked with Azure, uh, served like 20 million users with Wunderlist. Now we just launched a new app called Microsoft To Do for like all the Office 365 users who should be like 1.5 billion. But most of the time I was actually doing data janitorship, I think. I'm gonna try to explain to you what this does mean in reality. And most likely I'll try to explain some uh, roles I've seen developing in companies when they realize that they need data or more data or bigger data or yellow data, whatnot. And I'm trying to explain these roles in order of they typically appear in companies. If you're bored, you can walk away from this uh, presentation as of now because I'm gonna talk about li little things, simple things, really. Uh, I think the most important thing is the last one. We are all somehow computer science related people. And I think if we can keep in mind that just because we can do something, it does not mean that we should do it. This will save you the most headaches in your life, I'm telling you. If you try to be a bit more, I know, <laughs> humble in terms of what we can do and what we just put in production uh, and we keep KISS, like keep it simple, stupid, as a philosophy in mind, we're gonna have much better and more sleep, I think. First things first, when data becomes kinda important because we're just like, you know, growing and all the business people are wanna know something about what you actually do, the first role appearing is generally the business analyst role. It was like not coming from typically a computer science background, more likely somebody who thinks that they know a lot about business and business processes and numbers and whatnots. Uh, sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. But it's very important that if you're a business analyst, you can't skip leg day. What I mean here is that it's really, really easy to get to a wrong conclusion about your business, your business metrics, what you're trying to do if you don't actually understand what's in the data. What do we collect? What do we know? How do we collect? What, what do we lose and where it's going. So your main responsibility actually is to help this happen. Definitions are much more harder than do they sound. I remember once when we were trying to get to a definition of a, a cohort, we actually did choose a wrong definition because that was a definition that we could explain to people. We knew that there's like a much better def definition of a cohort, but our investors would just like lose their patience understanding it. But it's a good enough definition, and we're all it, with it for years. It's good. You have to really care about data quality. Data quality, I think, is the second <laughs> most underrated thing, just behind like Unix philosophy and simple things. You have to know your mileage. You have to know what do you leak. You will always leak. Nothing, nobody, never is perfect. But you have to know what's the baseline you have because it will definitely help you understand what you can know and what you can't know, what you can decide and what you can't decide at all. Keep eyes. Always, always just the simple things. I did work with a diverse set of uh, business guys, investors, even kind of big ones like Sequoia. Nobody ever did care anything about like what you find on the first page of the three-letter acronym list. Nobody. Sometimes it's really hard to actually answer these questions, and even they seem 
Billy sounds like monthly active user. What does it mean? What's active? How do you define it? You can spend a lot of time figuring this out, but again, in these ones maybe it's better to choose a wrong but understandable approach, rather have something that's super complicated, that's super precise and academic. KPIs must hurt. This is your number one rule if you are a business analyst, because it's not a Saturday afternoon techno party. You came here to get better in something. Uh, you don't want to look at numbers that are nice. You have to figure out where you can get better. For me, these are like trivialities, but sometimes it's really hard to see it happen. That you can run in one direction, you can't run in three directions, you can't have like three conflicting KPIs at the same time. I mean, you can, but you're gonna have trouble following them. And uh, just one small anecdotal like thingy that actually makes your life easier and better, which I, which I call the Friday five o'clock test, that a lot of the time it happens that somebody runs into the room, most likely somebody, a C star is like, hey, I want to know this now. I want to know this number now, I, I have to have it. And you have to always ask, like, okay, let's play out the thought experiment. I have your answer now. What will you do? What can you do? What can you do about it if it's Friday, five o'clock, and everybody went home? Maybe we can get back to this question, like, on a Monday morning. On the other hand, actionability is always, like, a generic thing that you have to keep in mind. It's really good, really nice to calculate a number, see a chart, but what can you do about it? If you can't do anything about it, just forget it. You can survive with a very, very simple set of tools. Uh, I put the metabase for just like an example. So actually, you can survive with almost open source tools, may I say. You, if you can rule SQL, that can, can be like a lingua franca for your company, for your team, because it's something that analysts can understand, computer science graduates can understand, and even data scientists can understand. And uh, believe me, that's gonna be enough. If you're gonna go further, check out Joel Spolsky, lovely presentation about why you suck at Excel. And also like Dan McKinley, they just joined I think MailChimp lately after uh, starting a very, very nice AWS related startup. The data even products, how they developed, were developed at Etsy. When the business analyst is getting overwhelmed, I think all the requests she's coming, and all the backend guys are getting angry at her. It's like, come on, like, we just can't help you anymore. Like, get an engineer. That's the time, typically, when a company tries to hire a data engineer or tries to call somebody a data engineer. Then we can always get back to the basics, like the 70s, like small donkey stuff. Use what you have. Don't rethink everything again. We see in the big, big data landscape with all these lovely logos and stuff and whatnot, don't reinvent everything. Don't reinvent the hot water, please. What you should not do. Don't apache it. Don't head up it, please. I was actually thinking about putting another slide here. It's about benchmarking all the hype things, all the things you can buy in the market, like Redshift and stuff, and all the things that you don't, know even know, don't even know about, like some Russian stuff here and there. And I decided not to put the slide in because then you would have cried, gone home, and quit your job. Not in this order, maybe. Uh, don't do anything of this. We are engineers somehow in heart. We like to solve problems that are not out there just to check the latest technology. Data engineering is not the thing where you can do that, actually. What makes a data engineer is if you can figure out how the dirty reality actually fits into what somebody ex uh, expected to be in backend. Like backend databases are always like clean and nice. There are constraints and stuff. What's coming from the outer world is most of the time is very, very dirty. If you can figure out what entity recognition means, you're good, I would say. And you have to do all these plumbing things that's related to data generatorship. You also have to, have to worry about your data quality, really. I think this, that should be like, like your main personal KPI in a company. What do you know about your data quality and what can you do about it? And yes, even testing is possible with data. Sometimes it's a bit awkward to kind of try to expect what kind of data sets could you have from the outer world maybe. It's really important to have. And yes, you can really test also. You are the main gatekeeper of the garbage in, garbage out approach. 
if something gets into the system, from now on, everybody's going to believe it. It's there. All the data scientists are going to make models based on your crap. You put into some databases here and there. Uh, if you want to be really effective, don't try to complicate your life. All this Hadoop thing was invented when people were happy about cheap Linux machines. These days, you can actually load the data set into a RAM drive and just grab on it. Nobody will get fired by for that. It's going to be much faster. And before we had to migrate to Azure, I could not have said that, but right now you can find pretty decent open source tool set. It doesn't really care about whether your data in AWS, Azure, on your own computer or whatnot. Google is a bit leaky here and there, but I think you can survive it without any kind of vendor lock-in. Unix. The thing we had with Wunderlis, for instance, for 20 million users, and what we have for the Microsoft To Do for like the 1.5 billion users, is done in Unix. With Make, with Bash, we use SQL, nothing special. And actually, what's behind it, the night shift, uh, that's like our ETL skeleton, you can find it in GitHub, is the same what's in production. No big deal. It's not like a candy store version, the same thing. Uh, even tracking is not that trivial if you try to figure it out from all the kind of different devices, but you can do it. Uh, we developed a tool called Hamustro, which is actually collects client-side data cloud agnostically, either to AWS or Azure or wherever you want it. And when I deployed it on my Raspberry Pi, it, it could serve more what we needed for all the 20 million users of Wunderlist. You can rely on it. These days, still, you can survive with classical, kind of classical data warehouses. I would say the MPP SQL data warehouse is classical now because they are out there for like 10 years almost in the market. You can choose. Azure Data Warehouse, Redshift, Vertica, whatnot, it's all kind of the same. Uh, you can look into benchmarks and you can get much faster than that, but I would say for survival reasons, generic purpose is going to be fine for you. And you're still within the SQL world. Please look around. Again, Dan McKinley, why to choose boring technology in production. It's very, very important because you don't want to don't die and you want to sleep on a Saturday night. And also, Python is something that's not the best for anything, but it's good enough for most of the things. It's kind of a good glue besides SQL that can be used throughout the whole organization for different roles. Data scientists. I would say, looking out in the market, I'm trying to hire data people for some years now. Uh, it's kind of easy to hire good data scientists. It's mid-hard to hire good business analysts. And it's very, very, very hard to hire good data engineers. Still, data scientists are a diverse set of people. Sometimes they're coming from the academia because they just like don't like academia and think that maybe the business environment is better for them. It's not necessarily so. Uh, and if they're like really like hardcore people, they just expect like this, you know, they got a clean data set and they have to make a model out of it, whatever it takes, and they will do it. Uh, it can be dangerous, I would say. Um, most of the time, you're not trying to uh, understand some big overarching structure in the universe, but more like some ephemeral thing that's happening on the website because, because people got drunk on e during Easter, I would say. So don't think that you're doing actual science. I'm a pretty uh, big anti-fan of A-B testing, and I'm there because I did that, been there, done that. I did burn myself. I'm going to talk about this later in, in more details. But what I would expect from, from data science that they should do is that uh, they also should be able to get out of their small box of quantitative analysis. Because most of the time, we just say, like, okay, this is, we know everything about the user. We, got, we know all the clicks around the world. Like, what do they do? Sometimes it's easier just to ask them, what do they do? It's like scratching your left ear with your right hand. Like, again, I'm guilty being there down that. Uh, don't try to figure out something that's 
deep inside down there in the data just because it's like a big challenge. Try to solve the problem, please. Talk to users also, like why you're trying to understand all the nitty-gritty details from the data. It's good to have an eye on like actually these, these are people who are doing something maybe with your product. This also helps if you like kind of work much more closer with other departments. So to understand like why do they want to understand these kind of things. The hard part being a data scientist is that most of the time business expects you to tell you where to go. Like, tell me, what's the secret? What's the aha moment? How are we gonna be rich and hockey stick and whatnot? The bad thing about it is like most of the time you can't do that. You're out there to tell the business where they are failing. They had an idea and your main job is to tell them as soon as possible that this just sucks and doesn't work. It's really hard because it's against the positivist approach of like capitalism and like growing and whatnot. And also people try to catch you like, okay, we figured this out, then this must be the cause. This is the hardest fight you have to fight all the time, that correlation and causation are really, really far from each other. And it will take like a lifetime to tell all this, A-B testing. I hate writing code, I actually like to delete code. I deleted the most code in our repositories. I'm pretty proud of that. But for a very nice set of reasons, we had to write a CRM system for ourselves. Bad idea, we did it, it was good. And while we write it, we're thinking that, okay, let's have A-B testing in there. Like we communicate to the users, we send local kind of stuff, let's A-B test the thing out. We just burned like man months of, of things, like resources, people preparing Android versions, properly testing them, blah, 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 all kind of stuff. And after running the tests, we just realized that, I don't know, out of like four tests, like none of them was worse than we had beforehand. So we're actually like patting our backs and shoulders, like it's good. But that's like a sad life. We burned a lot of money on not getting better. And that's the way it goes. Like that's a typical thing. That's a good thing, kind of. That's what we expected. But please have this very bad concept of Gartner in mind. It's called like total cost of ownership. Like what could you do with your time? Most likely it's very hard to get to like a meaningful, useful A-B testing thingy if you're small. And with Wunderlis we have like 20 million users, so we're kind of small. Uh, if you're Google, if you're LinkedIn or whatnot, that's a different scale. Still, it's a very, very big investment and maybe not the best use of your time. I don't read what's there. Uh, please reflect on these ones because they're interesting. Again, tool set. I would say that it's more important to be able to communicate to all the roles, all the departments in the company than to have your own thingy that you sit with the corner. And yes, I hate R. A lot of people hate R. I think most of the people hate R. But you can say with SQL and Python most of the time. And I would like to point out to one small thing that you can buy on the internet, I know, 50 bucks called Wizard. That can so solve most of your data-related statistical problems, just like this. Look at these two guys. They were here presenting in uh, Budapest some years ago. Both of them, even Miller and Chris Tukio at the Crunch conference. They talk about A-B testing in a much sophisticated, more sophisticated way than I can. Uh, but they are pretty down to earth people, so expect them to share their doubts. And maybe if you really, 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 really have to do A-B testing, please follow their advices. Machine learning, you have to have machine learning, otherwise VCs don't give you money. But these days I think you have, you have to have like deep learning to do that. Yes. I would say that machine learning is something that, I mean, I remember I went to university uh, in 1994, started university in computer science in 1994, and even at that time, everybody was like doing neural network theses because that was the fancy thing at the time. Not much has changed, I would say. And on the other hand, these are pretty simple concepts, I would say. And actually, you can really do it in Excel. I'm gonna show you a book that tells you how to do machine learning in Excel. It's capable of doing that. There are big expectations about machine learning most of the time, most of the time coming from businesses. Uh, we have to always fight this kind of giving false hope. That yeah, we just 
who's going to nail it? Like we have, we have machine, and we're going to have TensorFlow, and then pff, we're going to hockey stick. Most of the time, you're just going to try to reuse what's out there in the market. It's much more important to what you do is actually can be deployed fast and can be deployed good enough. I would even dare to say that if somebody asks you to have like some kind of a machine learning thingy in production, put a dice in production. That's the first phase. Put it there. Put the dice, put the RESTful API before it, and people can just ask requests from it. And maybe you can make it better with some heuristics or rules or whatnot. Maybe it's going to be machine learning sometime. Anyway, the much smarter guys are all out there in Kaggle, copy what they do. Find a similar use case to yours, try to think thim simple, try to avoid black boxes, try to use ensembles, that's what everybody do. And most likely where you're going to be special is that if you can feature engineer your data set in a way that's special to you, nobody else has it, then you're going to go good. But on the other hand, there was even like a lovely presentation about whether startups need machine learning at all and data science at all, because they just don't have that much data, actually, to be meaningfully useful about it. If you're growing bigger and bigger, uh, you're going to realize that this is going to be like your core thingy. It's very unlikely that you're going to build your own very special ways of, ways of uh, algorithmics, machine learning thinking. More like you're going to have like a core data set that nobody else has, or a core feature set. And maybe this data set is not, gonna, not just going to come from within the organization, but also you should be able to augment and then enhance it from all the sources. This one big mistake what data we always do is that we just think about what's, what's inside the building. Sometimes it's really meaningful to have, ref have and reflect on what you can get from the outside world to make your inside data richer and better. Approach. Simple. I mentioned MailChimp. They're a pretty big company with lots of smart people. What they do? They build a model, they put it in production, go back in three months and say if it's like need update or not. Don't think about something like a spaceship and NASA and whatnot. Hybrid approaches, I think, are pretty meaningful. If you're like a plain vanilla machine learning algorithm setup that you can actually understand what it's doing, but you also have like a domain expert who can help you figuring out the features that actually make sense for that. I think we're approaching a world where more likely we're going to become like machine instructors. We kind of can teach machines. The typical approach is that, yeah, machines going to just solve the thing by themselves and we going to have like AI extinction and whatnot. Or they say like, no, 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 we're going to do it manually. I think somewhere in between there's the truth. We're going to need more power tools that help us to tell the machine what to do. Look at TensorFlow. I was talking about TensorFlow uh, a month ago at the Craft Conference in more detail. I'm really happy about it. Generally, I don't endorse products. I'm not affiliated by Google, but that's a good product and it's going to stay around for a while, I would say. Again, tool set. It's more important to be compatible with the others than to have our own playground here and there. I put their big MO because if you don't have time and don't have the experience, that's a web-based thingy, you go there, it will run your model, and it's going to be fine. It's a good enough thing. Again, I try to emphasize that good enough, most of the time, is much better to be put into production than to wait for, like, you know, the big thing. I forgot to mention, but I added here now, that maybe you remember, I don't know, there was, like, Netflix competition some years ago when Netflix thought that, okay, we're going to give one million dollars to the people who are actually going to solve our recommendation problems. And then what happened is like some very smart people figure out the best way, but what Netflix had in production was actually playing vanilla algorithms with some very specific feature set engineered by humans. Because by the time the smart people figured out the problem, the problem changed. And by the way, they couldn't put it into production. It's just like too slow. Heroes of the day, this is the book about how to do data science a bit and machine learning in Excel, data smart. And Janssen was talking at the previous Crunch conference in Budapest about how to do data science in the common line, just in lay what we heard from booking.com. Yeah, head of data. Data becomes like really, really important. 
uh, I think the clashes in the file is gonna be much bigger because everybody has an opinion and whatnot. You've seen the big landscape of all the big data, blah, whatnot is out there, big data, small data, round data, go Mozart too, I would say. Um, don't believe anybody, it's like being in the X-Files. Don't believe no one. See it for yourself, benchmark it, and uh, I, I like to say that, that I'm, I'm old and slow and stupid and lazy, and if I understand it, if I can explain it to the others, then it's gonna be good. Don't do black boxes, because black boxes can do magic and can be miracles for some time, but when they fail, you're gonna be lost explaining what went wrong and how you can fix it. I was talking about shortly about hiring, it's hard, um, but this is the way we choose to do it. Data mythology is also a very important thing if like in a company, be it a small startup or a bigger one, you always have to maintain like, you know, this, if you look back in time, it should be like a smooth ride. Like if something crazy happened, we have to be able to explain why it happened, what went wrong. Uh, it's all filled with emotions. It's funny because data should be like this very rigid, rational thing, but everybody feels so attached to some numbers and whatnot. And they expect you to see the future, which will never happen. It's always like as we humans construct stories. If you look back in time, you see like this smooth ride. But if you see like for tomorrow, you don't know what's gonna happen at all. Your biggest job is gonna be that most of the time you're gonna tell bad news to the business. It rarely happens that you can tell to the CEO that we solved it, we nailed it, we're gonna be rich, we can go home. It's mostly about, hey, we just lost this. We just figured out that it's not gonna happen. And you're gonna be the main uh, membrane just where business people try to just go across and say like, yeah, we see that these people who have yellow hair, they're buying like 12 things. Let's talk to all the yellow people. So they're gonna buy everything. Everybody expects this kind of endless growth. Maybe it's ingrained in capitalism but it's really hard to figure out where you actually saturate the market and you try to figure out how to get there. And also like, that's the cargo cool. I've embedded here. And I'm sorry that this, this thing is so small here, but like there's a block who starts to smile and the data says, says no. And the block goes like sad. I think that's the easiest way to explain what we do every day. Marketing is gonna be hard not to crank because marketing is always something that you know you have to do and like you got a lot of budget and whatnot. Just to, to make some more enemies, I'm just trying to kind of top line this here. Yeah, Google Analytics is, is, is one of the worst drugs you can have out there. And I'm telling you why. Because if you don't spend like 150K per year, which is like unreasonable, you have sampling which is not explained to you how they do it. We measured it, it can be off by 20%. That's a pretty big thing, like you don't wanna run A-B testing on that. You have no user granularity, you have access to no raw data. Uh, and from th I think from for 150K per year, you can use a lot of open source tools and hire some people to actually do this job. But marketing departments generally are married to Google Analytics. It's a hard thing, it's an, it's an ongoing, ongoing battle that you will a lot of time have. I would say maybe that Facebook and Google is not your friend. You always have to remember that. If you just look into the news, that what kind of measurement problems did they have in the recent six months, maybe? I could even say that don't believe anything that they say. Still, there's a lot of money spent there. You try to figure out what's happened and you try to come up with some kind of attribution model, which is like close to magic, more likely. And please don't do net promoter score. Read the literature. This is crap. All the big companies are liking it because it's simple. It's kind of related to American MBAs, I would say. But it doesn't make any sense. Please read about it. Heroes of the day, it's a bit of a sad but very funny reflection on startups got disrupted. Please read that. 
It's a really entertaining book about an actual startup, like a named startup. You can go to the site. The startup is alive still. It's not like a fictional book. And also, like Venkat Ashram, I think, has written maybe one of the best books about management principles. That's like in the realm of the series The Office, I would say. If you watch that, please read it. You're going to like it very much. Thank you. I hope uh, I was still kind of understandable besides talking very fast. Please feel free to contact me or talk to me if you have any questions.